So welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Ed Friedman. I chair Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. For those of you that don't know me, um, we um, this is the 28th year of our winter speaker series. Um, been doing it on Zoom for a few years now since COVID struck, and it's nice because we we have members all around the country. And so, Mark Baker, like pleasure to have Mark. Mark and I have known each other via the internet for a few years now. Um, largely as a result of our efforts to stop the central main power tower lighting here at the Bay when they put in new towers. Uh, Mark's got a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from UC Santa Barbara. He was a computer programmer for over 20 years and a middle school math teacher for over 10 years. Uh, Mark's been involved in the effort to protect people from LED lighting since 2016 and founded the Soft Lights Foundation as a nonprofit uh, in 2021. Soft Lights is now one of the world's leading advocacy groups protecting people from the harms of visible light radiation emitted by light emitting diodes or LEDs, and also uh, working for the protection of natural light as a resource. Uh, most recently, in September 23rd, um, Mark filed a lawsuit against the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and the U.S. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, known not so fondly maybe as NHTSA, for failing to protect the public from hazardous and dangerous LED headlights. If, uh, if everyone could raise their hands, I'm sure that everyone on this call has been blinded by LED headlights. Uh, over 60,000 individuals have signed a, a, a public petition to ban blinding headlights. And uh, I, I do want to emphasize, while, while the intro talks about headlights, the program here is going to be about a lot more than that. Um, members of the public have submitted over 200 pages of comments to NHTSA, describing the debilitating and often life-threatening impacts of LED headlights. And, and Mark's lawsuit seeks to compel the FDA and NHTSA to collaborate and cooperate as is required by law to address the LED headlight crisis. And I'll drop back to the Central Main Tower towers here initially to bring this home. Um, one of the only um, natural resource-based uh, economic activities still on the Bay uh, has been commercial smelt fishing. And there's an operation right around the corner from me on the Abigadasset River. And one gentleman who worked here for many years could no longer work here when the CMP towers came up because those lights, uh, at that point they were on full time, now they're radar activated. Um, when those lights come on, they would cause him to have a seizure. And we'll hear more about that than Mark. So without further ado, Mark, you can start to share your screen now and uh, welcome and thank you again for being here. Okay, Ed, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, thank you everybody to coming to and listen to this presentation. I appreciate your taking the time to be here. Uh, my name is Mark Baker. Um, I got into this advocacy effort because LEDs impact me uh, severely. I used to be a middle school math teacher. Uh, and then when the LED started coming out in force on cars and streetlights, uh, and flashing lights on emergency vehicles. I couldn't take it anymore. And so I, I was no longer able to continue teaching. So I now spend my time uh, trying to get the government to do the right thing, protect us from these LEDs. On this opening screen, uh, blinded by the light pit perils and pitfalls of LEDs is a photograph of a person that I know uh, straight across the street from them. It's a car dealership. The car dealership wasn't there when she moved into her house uh, in Iowa, and there were uh, fireflies. Uh, the car dealership came in, built the car dealership, and then installed these lights. These lights, as you can see, are emitting very intense light with a high level of blue energy light, which is uh, toxic for us. And um, I will talk about it a little bit more later in the show, but uh, we, we fought them. Uh, with a lawsuit, and I'll tell you more at the end of the show what happened.
Warning, the next slide will show LED lights on a car, which can cause serious adverse reactions, including seizures for certain individuals. So I ask that if you are susceptible to seizure, uh, close your eyes, turn your head or something at this point. Um, let me just say one thing before I do that, though. You are watching uh, this presentation on a screen. It might be an LED screen. Um, the intensity of the LED screen would be about 300 candela per square meter or about 300 nits. So it's not nearly what the actual uh, real life headlight is like. So it's going to be less. There still might be some flicker for you, but uh, some people are going to still be sensitive and they cannot use LED computer screens at all. But um, so what you're seeing is a representation of a car headlight, um, but you're not getting the full impact, thankfully. All right, so this was from a website. Uh, it's a social media site called um, Reddit called F-U-C-K, Your Headlights, and people post video and photographs. This one was captured and posted. It gets a little bright. Okay, I'm gonna play it a second time because um, I want people to kind of grasp what's occurring in the, across the country, across the world uh, with these LED headlights. The car that we're looking at with the camera here, uh, we're kind of guessing, but I think those are LEDs. It's pretty white, uh, it has a white spread, it's pretty bright, and the car coming towards us probably had LED headlights. And so they, it appears to me that the two cars now, the two drivers are in a battle. They're, they want the, both of them want their lights to be dimmed. Uh, they're trying to indicate to each other that the lights should be dimmed, uh, but they don't have the ability because the machine is doing the work. So I'm just gonna play it one more time so you can sort of watch towards the end that this, this battle, this war is occurring. So for the driver, it's probably okay now, but then here's this other driver and now it's too bright. So the driver in the video is gonna indicate and do a little flash and then the other person is like, wow, that was too bright and he flashes back and now we have this battle. And so what we'll talk about here in this uh, presentation is sort of how did we get to this point where we're all Americans are fighting each other on the roads and other things like street lights uh, and um, other types of LED lights. All right, um, we're gonna talk about the LED physics first because this is, this is sort of what happened. The physics are different and we need to understand what happened with the physics. On this slide, we see uh, different uh, electromagnetic radiation as uh, the spectrum. And there are categories, uh, radio waves, there are microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet light, X-rays, gamma rays. And this sort of is the spread of the electromagnetic spectrum. The Food and Drug Administration is mandated by law to regulate this spectrum. That's their job, the US Food and Drug Administration. This law was passed in 1968 as the Radiation Control for Health and Safety Act. So after that uh, law was passed, the FDA got busy and um, did some regulations for microwave ovens. They did some regulations for lasers, sun lamp products, mercury vapor discharge lights. And then they did uh, regulations for different things that are in the X-ray. So television receivers, the old style cathode ray tubes um, and others. But that's it. Um, so they stopped quite a while ago, like I, I don't remember now, decades ago, they, they haven't published any new regulations for a long time. So on the left side of the screen, we see that we have new technologies like smart meters, which Ed has been involved in, cell phone towers, regular radios, never got any regulations, and Wi-Fi routers. There are no regulations for those. Um, the old style high pressure sodium lamps, they didn't have any regulations, no regulations for incandescent light bulbs. Maybe it wasn't important, but now we have LED light bulbs, uh, LED street lights, and what we just saw, LED headlights. So none of those are regulated. 
and the FDA has not been uh, collaborating with other federal agencies. Um, and so we just have this situation where we have this very uh, dangerous technology and uh, with nothing, nobody doing anything to protect us. If you search the internet for how light works and the terminology, you're gonna find charts like this, diagrams like this. Um, and so unfortunately, every word seems to have the letter L in it. And so it's hard to learn. It's taken me a long time to sort of get comfortable with these words. Um, but they have this idea of a source of light radiating out in all directions. And so the total light is called luminous flux and they measure that metric in lumens. So this is the total light emitted by the source. The next step is they have a cone, it's called a steradian. So it's like a three dimensional angle. And in the, within this cone, um, they can measure like the intensity of the light. It's called luminous intensity. That's measured in candela. Now, the, that does not require any distance to measure it, uh, to talk about it. So this can be independent of distance. Now, this picture is a little misleading, which is what one of the problems is that this next metric is called illuminance. And the old, old metric used to be in foot candles. Uh, the standard now is lux lumens per meter. But that's not actually dependent on this little cone. This lux is just how many lumens falling on a square meter. The last step in this picture is called luminance. This is an important metric for us with LEDs. It's how many candelas in a square meter, which is actually how many lumens per steradian per square meter. It gets kind of complicated. This whole picture here is for what I call traditional light sources. So the sun is a traditional light source, a candle, an incandescent light bulb. Those are traditional, even high pressure sodiums, even fluorescent lights. They all have a curved surface. And so they all have this idea that it radiates out in a what's called the inverse square law. LEDs really changed everything. And I'll show you in the next slide. So when I was first trying to learn all this stuff, this picture kept coming up and they don't have something for LEDs. It was very difficult to figure out what's different about LEDs. So Here's uh, an LED on a, coming from a flat chip. So on the previous picture, we saw that the, the light coming from the flat surface is denoted by this luminance, candela per square meter. So, but there's more going on. That previous picture didn't show us everything. So what occurs is that this light then comes from a flat surface. And because of the geometry, the light waves overlap each other and the density no longer is uniform. So the actual mathematical shape is called a Lambertian. He was a mathematician. So in the middle of the chip is you got the most overlap. So it's most dense in the middle of the chip, um, but off to the angles, off to the sides, it's less and less dense uh, and actually near zero on the edges. This really changes what the light, how it's distributed. And it turns out that if the light is reflected from a wall, it was the same thing. Once the light hits the wall, it comes off in this Lambertian shape, but nobody really, I mean, it was something that was known, but not really talked about. Now with high intensity LEDs, this is something critical and uh, not being uh, acted upon by the industry. So by the time the light finally hits your eye or whatever uh, target, um, it's, there's not an even distribution you may have felt an LED light hit you and felt a sharp pain. That's because in the middle, it's very intense or can be very intense, but then uh, it's less off to the sides. So this is something that is a big mess in the industry because they're not dealing with this issue. They've treated the LEDs just like a normal uh, source and it's, it's not, it's something different. This is a, a capture of luminous intensity from, you may have seen in the stores, 
uh, LED stick light bulb. So they've got these little sticks uh, inside and they're generally okay for me uh, with a kind of a low intensity. So this 114 candela, that's not too bright. And they're usually an amber color. But if we look at the spatial distribution of this light, you can see, I mean, this thing sort of looks like a bunt cake to me. Um, this is all by angles. There's no distances here. And you can see that the, each of these little uh, sticks generates this sort of bulb out here. And it's different colors because of that, because these light rays are overlapping. And, and here in the middle, there's no light at all. This is really different from traditional light sources, let's say an incandescent light bulb, where there, everything is just glowing and radiating out following an inverse square law, and everything's pretty uniform and it's gentle. Now we have this very intense light uh, with these like maybe gaps in between, uh, really high peaks of intensity followed by you know nothing. Uh, it's really different. And what we're finding is that people are suffering uh, seizures, migraines, anxiety. I mean, there's different neurological impacts from this, and it's not really known exactly why. We just know that, that people are suffering seizures from it, uh, whether it's flickering or not. I believe that it has to do with this weird uh, distribution. We need uh, to get people to start uh, addressing this issue uh, that this is unsafe. Another property of light is called the spectral property. So um, within this visible part of the spectrum, uh, there's different energy levels. So for sunlight, let's say at noon, uh, there's gonna be some ultraviolet light, um, some deep blue, some cyan, and then up through red and infrared. Generally, it's kind of about the same level of energy. So this would be a spectral power distribution of sunlight around noontime. It does change during the day. It's different during the morning and evening when it, there's more red, less blue. Down here, uh, we have uh, the same uh, spectral power distribution for an incandescent light bulb. So um, this is shows spectral power in watts per nanometer for a 60 watt A19 bulb. Um, where you can see that there's very little blue, a lot of red, and then like something like 90% of that energy is in the infrared, which we feel is heat. The government calls that waste. Um, but in fact, recent research is showing that that's not waste, it's actually beneficial. We actually want that for our bodies. It's useful for us uh, to take it away is actually probably unhealthy. Um, but the other key factor here is that there's very little blue. So over here uh, on the right-hand side, we see uh, LEDs. The Kelvin temperature is, is called the correlated color temperature. And it's a mapping of um, the spectral distribution against um, a heated metal as a reference point. So Kelvin is a temperature scale. It's very hot. This would be like, if you, if you, if you felt this, this would 3000 Kelvin is very, very, very hot but it glows, it gives off a color. And so if it glows at about 3000 Kelvin, it would have sort of a whitish, soft white kind of a glow. But you can see how different this spectral distribution is for the LED. It's got this peak of blue, and this has to do with the technology of how to get the LED and the phosphor that covers it to emit this so-called white light. And then you can see there's this peak of sort of orange, and there's like almost no red, and then there's basically no infrared at all. It's just visible light. So all of the impacts of the infrared that we might feel from the sunlight or from a candle or a fire even, we're not getting that. It's just like ultra processed light. And then this last one here, this one is uh, four, oops, sorry about that. This one is 4,000 Kelvin. Um, and so you can see that as we increase the Kelvins, the blue light is increased. This blue light controls a lot of our actions and is, is really as toxic at the same time. So this is pretty much a dangerous light. This is not something you want, this big peak of blue. 
You want it like this incandescent where there's very little blue, or you want it like sunlight where it's the same, same level blue, same level red. This distribution is not a good distribution, but that's how the LEDs are working. And then the temporal properties of LEDs, that's the time properties. So we have on our main electricity, we have uh, alternating current. It generates a sine wave. The sine wave of electricity comes into your house. It goes through a filament in the bulb uh, and then it reverses direction. Uh, and then, but this reversing of direction causes the, um, the bulb to flicker a little bit. You may not notice it right away, but it's there. There's a little bit of flicker. But because it's glowing, it never gets to zero. So if it's at 100% and then it switches direction, it drops down to, let's say, 90%. It's a little bit perceptible, but not too bad. So most people can tolerate this sort of gentle change. Things really changed when we went to LEDs. So on the right-hand side here, we see uh, flicker from an LED. LEDs essentially turn on and off instantly. So it's either on or it's off, and then it's on and then it's off. There are electronics where they may try to ameliorate that, try to get it to soften that up. But that duty cycle is from 100% to 0%. And um, that square wave flicker can cause a lot of health effects. And there are no regulations for this. So the manufacturers are free to do whatever they want. Uh, a more quality bulb might uh, eliminate some of the flicker, but they can never turn it into a sine wave. It'll always be a square wave. And, uh, and then the cheaper bulbs you may buy, you know, somebody might buy them from the store and they, they may flicker noticeably. Some people can notice the flicker more than other people and their lives have really been interrupted by this square wave flicker. Another temporal property is like what they might use for a dimmer switch or for LED headlights, it's called pulse width modulation, where they purposely will dim the light by turning it off. So they're not really dimming it. A, a dimmer uh, with an incandescent would actually just let less electricity through. This is fake. So they're getting your perception that it's not as bright by turning it on and off but they've introduced this square wave flicker. If you put it on a dimmer switch or on headlights, they, the, the way they do it is the chip is very intense. And then if you are on low beam, they're using the full intensity, but flickering it. And you can see this flicker on car headlights. If you take a video, sometimes you'll see it flicker when you play it back in slow motion. So this is also really dangerous and also really is unregulated. So uh, these are big differences between uh, traditional light sources and um, LEDs. All right, so, so here's something uh, that is so-called so common knowledge that LEDs are supposedly more energy efficient than incandescent. That's why we switch to LEDs, right? Because uh, they're more energy efficient. So it turns out that that's not true. Um, I have these arguments with people about this because they're surprised, but it's really straightforward. It's nothing, uh, it's pretty straightforward. So let me see if I can demonstrate that for you, why LEDs are not actually energy efficient. So how did this all start? Um, the Energy Policy Act of 2005, Title IX, Section 912, Item C has these obje objectives. The objectives of the initiative shall be to develop organic, or, oops, I just moved my screen here a little bit. Um, the objectives of the initiative shall be to develop advanced solid state organic and inorganic lighting technologies based on white light emitting diodes that compared to incandescent and fluorescent lighting technologies are longer lasting, are more energy efficient, and cost competitive and have less environmental impact. So this is a directive in this Energy Policy Act of 2005 to um, have the Department of Energy go and see if they could develop such a bulb. 
Well, it didn't happen. The Department of Energy did not meet Congress's directive to develop solid state lighting that is more energy efficient than incandescent or fluorescent because LED light is lower in quality than incandescent and fluorescent. And so it's really been, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm tr trying to drag my thing around here. Um, so it's really been a, I, I call it a fraud. All right, in 2014, um, the DOE wrote about LEDs. They have a long report. I've got the link there at the bottom. They use these terms, radically new technology, directional and unique characteristics. Now, if I saw that, I would say, wow, scary. Um, we ought to check this out. Is this safe? Radically new technology, directional light, unique characteristics? Hmm. It really never happened. Despite, the, despite these words, they just went ahead full steam and now we have LEDs everywhere. The Department of Energy website states, energy efficiency is the use of less energy to perform the same task or produce the same result. I'm here to tell you that LEDs do not produce the same result as incandescent, as we sort of uh, have talked about already in this presentation. All right, this slide has a lot going on, but it's gonna help us understand, um, do we, is this, are these LEDs energy efficient or not? So we talked about this on the previous slides, the spatial property of an incandescent light bulb is uniform illumination radiating out in an inverse square law, gentle, that's the way I call it. LEDs emit this Lambertian shape. So within the center of the beam, it's very intense. Following a cosine law, it drops off towards the edges. That's radically different. This is why the Department of Energy calls it a directional light because it is directional. It's not something natural, it's something completely different. And it's very intense in that sharp pain you might feel that's what's going on. So those that's different already. So these two spatial properties, completely different. Spectral properties, we saw that an incandescent is from low blue to high red and high infrared. Whereas the LED has this sharp peak of blue and then like no red. So that's drastically different. And then the temporal properties, sine wave flicker versus square wave flicker. So in my opinion, every property is different, radically different, and yet the definition for energy efficiency is same quality, less energy, same performance task, less energy. But if you look at this chart that I grabbed off the internet, they've got incandescent light bulb using 40 watts to produce 450 lumens versus the LED at only nine watts to produce the same 450 lumens. However, what you don't see in this chart is you don't see the spatial distribution changes. You don't see the spectral dis distribution changes. You don't see the temporal changes. And so they're calling it, well, from least efficient to most efficient. It's not true. Everything has changed. This LED is a very low quality light. So that, I call this fraud. So you can't say this is energy efficient. It's called luminous efficacy. The number of lumens per watt of energy has increased, but the characteristics have totally changed. And so this, is, this myth is re repeated by the media, the Department of Energy, lighting industry people, common knowledge. Everybody thinks, oh yeah, LEDs are energy efficient. It's not true. All right. So what's going on is that like, does anybody care? Does that matter? Yeah, people are getting hurt from this light. We started collecting reports of harm as have others. So in April of 2024, the Soft Lights Foundation began collecting these reports of harm uh, because the government's not doing it. So I'll just read through a few of these for you. Um, September 21st, 2024, um, Quote, the LED headlights reflected off an interior glass see-through door. It was at a slight angle. Hit me in my left eye, mostly. Part of the right eye. Instant reaction, blink reflex, yet couldn't open my eyes. Couldn't walk. Felt short of breath. 
almost threw up, stood in a veg tape for several minutes, couldn't respond to anyone's questions despite hearing them. So this is a non-epileptic seizure. I know this person actually. Um, and so when she's struck by LED light, this is what happens to her. She's been in, uh, evaluated at a, a clinic. Uh, they do traditional light sources. There's no problem. It's LEDs only. We don't know exactly why, but it's something to do with the spatial properties or the spectral properties. We don't think it's actually anything to do with flicker. It has something else. And this is what's happening to her. September uh, 17th, 2024, my neighbor keeps her very strong LED lights on over her garage all night from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. And I cannot sit in the room where their light shines into my kitchen area. I feel sick and nauseous. September 16th, I have mast cell activation syndrome. My body produces an allergic reaction to things that wouldn't normally cause anyone else a problem, including LED lights. Every time I leave the house at night, I get sick. I'm already disabled by multiple chronic conditions. My life is already limited. I don't know how to live life, unable to even go outside at night. Um, the LED lights in the stores have now even made it to where I, I cannot shop if they have the newest LED lighting. I know what stores to avoid. It'll actually make me very sick if I go into a store. So the Soft Lights Foundation is collecting these reports. We have almost 150 since April. We're submitting these to the Food and Drug Administration and trying to get them to start paying attention. Uh, this Reddit site uh, it collects these uh, photo and video evidence uh, basically on headlights. There's some with flashing lights and others, but as you can see, People are posting, you've probably experienced this. It's a good database. I go through this uh, site uh, once a month, collect all these photographs, and I submit them to the Food and Drug Administration. I also submit them to NHTSA. Um, they're in denial. The, neither the Food and Drug Administration nor NHTSA wants to acknowledge this, but you can just see in the photographs, it's awful. And uh, so these complaints uh, form a good database for us to say, hey, it's time to do something. Um, our organization maintains a petition that was started by another individual eight years ago. It's on change.org called Ban Blinding Headlights. We now have collected over 60,000 signatures um, and thousands of comments. So for example, these three here, I've almost been killed driving at night on mountain roads, try to avoid night driving altogether now because of this, but sometimes it's unavoidable. Whomever thought this was a good idea should be shot. Wow, um, this is long overdue. LED headlights are without a doubt blinding to oncoming drivers. As I know, uh, so many um, do enough near death experiences. And finally, I, I used to love driving at night because there were fewer cars on the road. All I had to do was uh, watch out for wildlife crossing the road, but now I have to wear sunglasses at night and constantly adjust my mirrors raise my hand to block the light reflecting my rear view mirrors. What's the point of these mirrors anyways, if we can't see? That's the problem with these LED lights. We can't see because of them. Um, there's a picture right here, um, halogen. That's a, a gas on top of the incandescent or the tungsten filament. That's the safest light. Xenon are also known as high intensity discharge. They have more blue, they're sharper, they're not as good. LEDs are even worse. And then lasers was coming, uh, they were even worse, but manufacturers are starting to back off from that because it's just super expensive and too bright and it's just a bad idea. What I would advocate for is getting back to halogens. All right, human health. So melanopsin is a light sensitive protein. It's recently discovered that it's everywhere throughout our bodies in the retina, blood vessels, brain, fat tissue, skin, liver, uh, and it's sensitive to light, especially blue light at 480 nanometers. Why is this significant? Because the fact that we have proteins throughout our bodies indicates that we can detect light even without our eyes. Blue light is the primary control. This means that the detection of light is fundamental that everything we do and the introduction of artificial light in our environment is playing havoc with everything that's going on within our bodies. 
So this melanopsin is really important and it's, it's, it's in our skin and, it's, and you don't need to have your eyes open for this. So this is a big deal that they, it's recently discovered how this all works. So um, our eyes are a major detector of this light. We have a lens and then uh, in the back of our eye on the retina, we have rod cells are on the edges and cone cells are in the middle. So these cone cells um, will detect the colors. So there's a small, a medium and a large and uh, red, green and blue. And that's the only three colors we can actually detect. Colors like purple and orange and other colors are just interpretations by our brain. And then these rod cells are seven times more efficient, but they don't see color. So these are what are used at nighttime vision. Um, the LED lights that have come out now are, are uh, bleaching these rod cells. When you drive and you get struck by LED street lights or LED headlights, these get bleached out and they're no longer functioning. And so at nighttime, you're using more energy than you used to trying to, and there's no color that you should be seeing uh, using your um, cone cells. Um, in addition to these cells that recently discovered in the last couple of decades was an intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, which detect light and control our circadian rhythms, very important. Uh, and so they don't contribute to vision, but they contribute to everything else. And it's really important uh, that it be dark at night and light during the day. Everything we do is controlled by this. And uh, so we, we need to keep things dark. Ed, can I ask you something? Um, you're on mute here, but I'm at yes. 30. Oh, go ahead. Got, yep. I'm at 36 minutes already. Um, do I need to hustle up? Um, I don't know how much more you have to go. I don't remember. So you're, I think okay. you're doing okay. I think I'm doing all right. All right. Excuse <laughs> the interruption there in a little bit. Um, I feel like it's going long. Um, all right. So our neurology. Um, is the nerves. So the uh, electromagnetic radiation is converted to electrical signals, but we have these biological expectations of the light. We have should have sunlight during the day. We should have starlight and moonlight during the night. The light should be spatially uniform. It should be continuous. Uh, it should be reflected from an object. That's the whole purpose of vision. The light should be coming from an object and it should be at a low intensity. LEDs have changed everything. Every, all of our expectations uh, as far as evolutionarily have changed now. And so it's not necessarily true that our brains can tolerate that. As I mentioned, some people suffer seizures or migraines uh, and that's because their brains just are more sensitive and this LED light is just too intense. So a uh, little picture here, um, the neurological impact. So on the left, we have a candle, an incandescent gas discharge. We call those traditional light sources. Uh, and the light's pretty gentle. It's uniform, comes to our eyes, sends signals up to the brain. We have vision. That whole process is called vision. Um, but an LED chip, as we saw earlier from the physics, is non-uniform very intense in the center, less intense down towards zero on the edges. And for like somebody like me, there's some sort of a short circuit, it's intolerable. And so that the signals are getting to the brain and, and something's happening. Uh, it's just overwhelming the whole uh, situation. So these unique characteristics that the Department of Energy talked about, the directed energy beam, the spatially non-uniformity, the extreme luminance, the blue light, especially in the square wave flicker, are causing non epileptic seizures, epileptic seizures, migraines, panic attacks, and people have called me telling me they want to commit suicide. So it's a very dangerous light. Um, here's an example. So one person has called me and said, This light uh, has, wants me to kill myself. It's, it, it doesn't really, it's a little bit yellow in the picture, but it's really a blue light. And the blue seems to be overwhelming this person. So he's suffering anxiety, anger, and thoughts of suicide. We've contacted the city, they don't care. Well, that's just the way it is. They claim that's energy efficient. It's not energy efficient, it's dangerous. We're over lighting. This grass, we should not be seeing green grass at night. It's nighttime. 
it should be gray. Um, and so here's a high pressure sodium in the background. It has its own problems, but it was a lot safer than this LED light. For me in particular, these LED flashing lights are devastating for me. I suffer anxiety and anger and panic, thoughts of suicide myself. When these lights go off on police cars, ambulances, fire trucks, it's over overwhelms me. I may have to stop my car if I'm driving, um, somehow, you know, dive for cover, whatever. So th these are all, everything's unregulated, dangerous, and we're trying to get the government to do something about it. Um, these are, I just listed out just a few of the many hundreds or thousands of studies uh, about the hormonal impacts, the circadian rhythm impacts of light. It's all artificial light at night, but especially LEDs, especially blue light. So hormones are chem chemical uh, messengers that travel through the bloodstream to carry signals to organs, tissues, other parts of the body. So here's a few of the recent studies, just their titles. Light pollution, time to consider testicular effects. Outdoor nighttime light exposure, light pollution is so associated with Alzheimer's. This was just came out a month ago. Uh, it's a big deal. Um, outdoor light at night, air pollution and risk of cerebrovascular disease, day and night light exposure are associated with psychiatric disorders, outdoor artificial light at night and risk of early onset dementia. Oh, I guess that's sort of a duplicate of this. Light and at night and cause specific mortality, early mortality, uh, and overweight obesity in school is associated with outdoor light at night. And there's many more diseases, more can uh, risk of cancer and such. So the whole switch to artificial light at night is really, really, really bad for the whole planet. Um, this is a, was in Newsweek, September 6th, a month ago, um, showing uh, which states have the highest levels of light pollution, East Coast. In Maine, you guys are doing all right. Um, but these other states uh, are the highest. I'm in California. They're not doing too well either. And as we saw, um, there's all these impacts. We have been uh, getting worse and worse uh, throughout the world with light pollution, and it's having massive health impacts on us. What about the environment? So here's a picture you might find on the internet. This is what light pollution looked like in the 1950s. East Coast has more, um, but there's a lot of uh, gaps in there where there's little light pollution. But as you can see in the 1970s, 1997, I think this 2025 was an estimate. It's just getting so much worse and uh, it's impacting everything, all life forms, everything on earth, including the ocean. So I have here, um, this is, 21 United States Code 360-IIA2, which is the Food and Drug Administration, is supposed to plan, conduct, coordinate, and support research, development, training, and operational activities to minimize the emissions of and the exposure of people to unnecessary electronic product radiation. Well, unnecessary electronic product radiation in the visible light part of the spectrum is known as light pollution. So um, I'm gonna to try to get the Environmental Protection Agency and the Food and Drug Administration to start regulating light pollution. That's a goal of mine. Here we have a full moon. Um, it's hard to tell these days whether these things are artificial intelligence generated or if this is a real picture. Um, but on the bottom here, um, Oh, I can't see my own text. Oh, there we go. Full moon illuminates. That's the light landing on the ground is 0.1 lux. It also changes throughout the month. So this is full moon, but it gets darker when we have a new moon. So this is something important to pay, pay attention to, 0.1 lux. So this chart shows us that sunlight is 107,000 lux. Um, I think... I think that would be like directly from the sun. Full daylight uh, is a 10th of that. And then you can see these powers of 10 um, at twilight. So it's not quite dark yet. Here's this 10 lux. Well, street lights are also 10 lux. So when you have street lights outside of your house that the government put there, you're getting perpetual tw twilight. And yet the full moon is 100 times less bright than that, 
And if you had a starlight uh, only, it would be a hundred times less than that. So it's, it's way too bright. The picture here on the left shows us, looks like the desert to me, um, starlight. Um, and there's, you know, there's a little bit of light there, a little hard to walk, a little can be kind of dark. Uh, but this is sort of the level that natural environment is expecting. When it's full moon, uh, many people can actually walk around. Uh, maybe you're using your rod cells and it's, there's no color, but you can navigate. So when they put all these street lights in, if you look at this picture on the right, it's at 10 lux. And then you got a dozen of these lamps just on one street. They're not any, but even on the street, not using it. And so you're really wrecking the environment by putting these LED streetlights. These should all go away. We need to get back to natural systems. One example is firefly mating. Uh, these fireflies uh, are disappearing. This is really sad. And they're disappearing because they're habitat loss and then they're also because there's just too much light. So this diagram shows a male uh, flashing up to 14 times per minute. Uh, most of the time is around here at, at three. But, um, but when you introduce even, even five lux, so half of a streetlight uh, brightness, you can see that there's way less uh, flashes. And then the female is responding to this. Uh, and you can see that for no light, there might be a triple response but uh, as high as uh, over 50% responses. If you introduce even five lux of light, it cuts it way down. So the mating is interrupted by this artificial light. So um, to protect fireflies, we need to get rid of the artificial light, even down to very, very low levels. Another example that was in the news last year or two years ago was on insect populations in general. Uh, they did some studies and collected moths and worms uh, caterpillars, I should say. And uh, so in unlit areas, they're collecting about this many uh, per unit. And then uh, high pressure sodium was somewhat less, but LEDs were a lot less. So this so-called white light is brutal. It's, it's too bright. It's too blue. And now if you're not catching the caterpillars, it means they're not there. What happened to them? They may have died. Maybe predators ate them, or maybe they just couldn't forage, they couldn't find mates, all kinds of bad things happen. So uh, whatever this is in this photograph is, is a, shouldn't be happening. This is uh, something that should go away. LED products, I uh, just have a couple of listed here. Um, this is an example of, I would guess, 5,000 Kelvin LED streetlights just way over lighting this pathway, getting into the lake on the side here, creating shadows at nighttime. That's pretty ridiculous. You shouldn't have shadows at night. The trees are trying to sleep. They can't sleep. Um, and then if you're using the pathway, you're getting struck with glare. So it's, it can be painful, uh, debilitating for some people. Uh, it's uncomfortable and it wasn't energy efficient. It's just this low quality light. And so uh, this is really a big mess right here. Um, I, I'm kind of long on time, so I was, I'll just go over this quickly, but, um, so these headlights, uh, this is a chart from NHTSA, uh, all these little dash lines is where there's no limit. And if you put these together, I have a colleague who put these little things together in a chart. It turns out that all these little dash lines are directly in front of the car. That's why we have a problem. There's no limit on the intensity directly in front of the car. That might have worked okay for halogens and tungsten filaments, but it's not working for LEDs. So that's what we're trying to do in the Soft Lights Foundation. Is get, that's why I'll tell you about my lawsuit in a second. Um, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, there needs to be a limit, okay, uh, to protect our eyes. Um, and the, also the NHTSA has no limit on blue. So that's also critical. So this chart here is the whole problem. Um, you know what, I'm just going to, um, well, okay. So then, so again, I'm going to warn you the next slide will, is just to show you an example of these LED flashing lights on ambulances that are so uh, devastating for me and also are impactful for many people that complain, I can't see the road. So just warning that's coming up here.
All right. So, so that th there's no reason for that. It, it's dangerous for everybody. It's incapacitating for many people. It's discriminatory, those LED lights. And that's another thing we're working on, which we're trying to, to get uh, the government to, to stop using those. So this is the last section here, uh, regulatory and legal. Uh, what is the Soft Lights Foundation, Foundation doing about it? And what am I doing about it? Um, so I won't go into all these sections, but this 21 USC code part C, electronic product radiation is the Food and Drug Administration's directive from Congress to control this LED light. And they don't wanna do it. They haven't been doing it. They have no, no interest in doing that. Um, but all these uh, codes, this is the law, is telling the FDA, you need to regulate these things and you can look it up. And um, so they're not doing it. Um, so these two parts, it's uh, one through six. Um, another thing they're not paying attention to is the Americans with Disabilities Act. I qualify because I have mild autism. Uh, that's why the light's so sensitive for me. And there are laws that they, when they did this change, they were supposed to make sure that it was readily accessible and usable by individuals with disabilities. That means all these lights shouldn't have impacted anybody with epilepsy or autism or migraines or PTSD or any of that, because there was a law already that was required and, and nobody cares. So that's another reason why I'm filing lawsuits is because it seems to be the only way to get the government to listen is by filing lawsuits. Um, this was at the beginning of this show uh, was the person's house across from the car dealership. Um, and so you can see that's her house that's being just inundated with this light. So we hired a law firm, um, the Soft Lights Foundation, and we spent two years and $75,000 suing uh, that car dealership. And in the end, the Soft Lights Foundation strategically simply withdrew from the lawsuit. It was then settled for an undisclosed confidential amount. The lights are gonna stay with the plaintiff, uh, the person that was living there, she's gonna have to move. So we kind of lost. Um, it was just emotionally draining for the person living there. It was wrecking her health. Um, we could have maybe won, uh, but we could have lost. And so um, it was just a strategic move. It was sort of a test case for us. It wasn't really a great outcome. Everybody kind of lost. Um, so that is a lesson for us now. And, and the main thing that we use was nuisance, the nuisance, uh, uh, common law nuisance. Um, my original lawsuit against the Food and Drug Administration, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I learned how this works. Uh, I, was, I filed it in January. Um, in May, the FDA denied petitions that the Soft Lights Foundation has submitted already, regulatory petitions. They denied all four. It's just a bunch of lawyerly stuff to get out of it. But um, in July of 2024, the longtime Center for De uh, Devices and Radiologic Health, Tre Jeffrey Sherman, he, he retired. He'd been there for 14 years. It was his decision to let these LEDs get out there. So that's a big deal. They ha now have a new acting director and maybe there's a change of heart, I doubt it. But because of that, um, we had a hearing on my first lawsuit on September. Uh, the judge was listening carefully, but he was kind of leaning towards the government. So I filed a motion to voluntarily dismiss my original lawsuit. Um, I haven't heard back from the judge. I don't know where, where it's at at this point. But um, instead I filed a new lawsuit on September 23rd because this one uh, statute here requires NHTSA and the FDA to maintain a liaison. They're not, they're, they're doing nothing. They don't talk to each other. They're not interested in talking to each other. So the reason these LED headlights are, are uh, so bright is because the NHTSA claims that FDA has to do the regulations. FDA claims that NHTSA has to do the regulations. Wow, so they, they're pointing at each other my job here is, as filing a lawsuit is to try and get them to comply with the law. Um, and I, I have plans for future lawsuits uh, against the, Cal, uh, the CPSC, uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission, Federal Highway Administration, and as I mentioned, the EPA. So these are, those are my plans for 2025. Um, I have another lawsuit locally. Uh, these RRFBs, they're called, that flash this strobing light, like incapacitate me, I can't walk. I have to close my eyes. I can't move when these lights are in my eyes. So they have here, you can see a wheelchair access. The whole 
point of this thing is to, for access for so wheelchair users. And then now for me, it's a discriminatory barrier. So I'm testing some lawsuits to see if I can get these things to go away. All right, for you all listening, thank you very much for listening. Uh, we're coming to the end. These are your best practices, what you can do uh, at your own house or get the government to do that. As you can see, I changed the background color to dark. That's what we want. Amber, red, those colors are pretty much okay. Your best choice, turn it off. You get to see the stars. You get to protect your, uh, the nature. It's better for your health. Just turn it off. Um, bollards are these short uh, sticks in the ground that keep the light low. Put some red lights in there. And, uh, and this is like an observatory in Ohio. You can still get around, uh, but it's a lot safer and gentler. Amber lights are better. Uh, and fully shielded lights, keep it on your own property. Don't put glare into other people's eyes. So make it look like this at your own house. Turn it off when you're not using it. All right, what can you do? I like to, a lot of news articles will put the onus on the individual. It's a systemic problem, but there are things that you can do. First, the natural night is a fundamental resource that is necessary for our health and well being. Protection of this resource is crucial. Natural light is a resource, just like water, just like air. The LED and light pollution catastrophe is a systemic failure by government officials. And what we're trying to do at the Soft Lights Foundation is to get them to listen. So what can you do? You can contact your member of Congress, ask them why the FDA has abandoned their electronic product radiation control program for cell phone towers, uh, smart meters, LED headlights, LED street lights. They don't, they don't, the FDA isn't doing anything. Ask your congressperson why. Um, uh, you can submit an LED incident report at the Soft Lights Foundation. We're gonna submit those once a month to the FDA. These are really helpful reports. If, if an LED bothers you, submit a report to us. The government's not collecting these reports, we are. You can file your own lawsuit. You wanna contact me, I'll teach you how to do it. Finally, turn off the lights. Thanks for listening, I really appreciate your time. That was great, Mark. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to ask: Are are the um, do you accept contributions uh, to Soft Lights? Uh, how do people find Soft Lights Foundation? A couple of points there, and then are there other groups besides? I know there's the International Dark Sky Association, and you guys. Are there other groups around working on these issues as well? Uh, and I know there's a little bit of a mix between dark sky versus LED lighting and you're sort of working on both a little bit but could you could you expand on the universe of activists on the darkness and lighting issues yes and um first donations we're not really like we're not into the money thing I'm funding this out, out of my pocket um but you can donate some people feel that makes them feel like they're contributing. So we have a donate button at softlights.org um, and you can donate, uh, uh, but don't feel like you have to. Um, as far as other organizations, um, Light Aware uh, in the United Kingdom is like a similar to Soft Lights Foundation. They're doing good work over there. It's called Light Aware Charity. Um, and those are really the two organizations that are focused in on LEDs um, the, the Dark Sky International has been around for a long time. We don't really agree with each other. They, you know, organizations tend to get big and they have like a structure going on and they're kind of connected to the lighting industry. The, the, the work that they've done is not all bad. They have science and stuff, but they're not, uh, certainly not aggressive enough on the LEDs. So, you know, we're, they're out there. You can go check out what the Dark Sky International does uh and you know they're trying to protect natural things but it's more the soft lights foundation um other than that there's there are um really that's about it um and as far as activism goes you any of you listening wanted to get involved you can contact me uh and we can talk about it i noticed paul had a comment uh, that um LED lights go on and what I think it was the radio interference starts to, you know, uh, starts to be a problem with interference. So it's because of the electromagnetic radiation emissions, I assume. Is that correct? 
Yeah. So, uh, so these, these are electronic products. So when the electricity comes into your house, it's alternating current. LEDs run on direct current. So there has to be this conversion process. So within those electronics, uh, the electricity is converted from alternating current to direct current and the out, the, what creates dirty electricity and radio frequency, uh, you know, junk on it. So it's not a good light for your house, your house. Now, for those of you that are electromagnetic sensitive, now it's, it's unhealthy. It may interfere with your radio, et cetera. It, it's electronic products. Uh, it was much better to have just this simple burning incandescent light bulb. Um, Julie asks, she, she's one of our <clears throat> longtime EMF uh, folks and was was a, a party to the original smart meter uh, um, actions in Maine here. Uh, incandescent bulbs are no longer sold. Are LEDs the only options for homes? <laughs> yeah, what a mess. What a yeah. mess. So, um, yeah, so we're having to deal with it. When the government says you can't sell the safe product, you can only sell the hazardous product. Wow. So uh, what we tell people is there are a couple of workarounds. Uh, one is uh, there's two types of bulbs that are still allowed. So if they have a label of appliance light or, um, oh, uh, shoot, um, rough service, those labels, they're still incandescent light bulbs, but if they have those labels, you can, you can still purchase them. They might cost a little bit more, it might uh, emit a little bit less light, but it's still an incandescent light bulb. So you go online and if you look for it, look for a rough service or appliance and uh, th they should still be the same base uh, or make sure it's an A19 base. Um, other people that are on our groups, they're going to uh, Facebook marketplace and getting people's old <laughs> lights that they have around. So what we're trying to do is like, okay, let's try to survive for a couple of years until we get the government to sort of undo this. It would have been an impossible task, but that's what we're trying to do. Let's get the government to undo this ban on safe incandescent light bulbs. Well, good luck. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Paul, Paul notes his granddaughter has a playpen full of amazing LED lighted products, which she loves. Yeah. You know, we see we see sneakers with LED flashing lights on them, right? It's it's incredible. Uh, it's they're everywhere. So just uh, just this week, there's an announcement. So France is do, probably doing the best at this. They're a little bit more in charge, and so they actually have regulations on LEDs in children's toys. It just got discovered uh, by some people that I know uh, that the the limits that they set were too high the people that did the limits uh, made errors in their calculations. And so now they're saying, oh, we got to redo these regulations. We got to reduce it by 10 times. It was that high. Well, in the United States, there's zero regulations for any of these LEDs. The Consumer Product Safety Commission has no regulations uh, for children's toys with LEDs. So this is dangerous. I see children in stores, these LED strip lights. These are really hazardous for our children. And there's no limit on this intensity. And so this is one of the things that if you can contact you as a listener, you want to contact your senator, your congressperson and say, hey, why aren't there any uh, regulations for children's toys with LEDs? Don't we care about our children? And that's maybe a way we can get in. So um, I'm hoping to sort of leverage that study that just came out. Well, for, for France has been ahead of the curve on the electromagnetic frequency stuff as well. Yeah. Right. Uh, early, early on to, to sort of prohibit wireless devices and a lot of the libraries, at least with the libraries serving kids and uh, also finding that uh, doing independent cell phone testing and finding that a lot of cell phones are uh, emitting electromagnetic radiation at well above the, uh, the uh, published limits, which are already too high, um, but calling attention to that. So, yeah. I think your idea of leveraging the the kids piece is is really a good one. Um, so for here, so I, I, seeing no other comments or questions, I think again I'll just thank you very much. Thank you all for coming, and uh, thank Martin again for for handling the tech side of this. We'll have a recording up in a, in a couple of days or so probably, and uh, yeah, hope to see you all next month. And uh, any further questions on this, please feel the contact feel free to contact me or Mark. Thanks again, Mark. 
Thank you, everybody.